All right, how's it going? It's Matty listening to Looking Sideways Action Sports podcast, the show where I try and uncover the most interesting stories in action sports and other related endeavours. All right, let's not mess about. This week, I've got a bit of an all-time hero on the show and one of the names that was definitely on that apocryphal original list of dream guests I made when I was planning the podcast back at the beginning of 2017, almost four years ago now. Yes, it's Greg Stump, filmmaker, skier, snowboarder, genuine pop cultural legend due to the success of 80s and 90s snow films such as License to Thrill, Maltese Flamingo, A Fistful of Moguls, Siberia, and of course, The Blizzard of Oz. I mean, let's just look at those incredible names which straight away give you a glimpse into the type of creative ambition and artistic approach Greg was bringing to his craft. Now, and indulge me, because this is going to be a long intro, and I make no apologies for that. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that Greg is as influential a guest as I've yet had on the Looking Sideways podcast. Now, if you've never heard of him, and it is tragic how little profile he has these days, given the extent of that influence, you're probably thinking, yeah, right, whatever. But I'm hoping that by the end of this episode, you'll be in agreement with me on that as the full extent of his influence on our culture is revealed even on a purely personal level greg really did change me and my friends lives i mean picture the scene it's 1990 in manchester i'm 14 i've just discovered skateboarding pretty late fair enough but it was 1990 i've met i've met a massive big group of new friends and i've started joining them on weekly trips up to rosendale dry ski slope where I originally learned to ski and then snowboard, basically because you just couldn't get snowboards, really, unless you had cash, which I didn't have. Um, So, yeah, you know, I learned to ski first, and I learned to snowboard after that. And as was the habit back then, we all started passing around any videos we could find that had anything to do with this new culture of which we were so enamoured. And of these films, one of them was Blizzard of Oz, and it did completely change my life. I mean, I lived in Stratford in the middle of Manchester. People weren't doing seasons. Snowboarding wasn't on TV. Moving to the mountains wasn't on the agenda. Skiing, and this is important, in the UK was generally for posh people. And then here's this film which showcased this, to me, massively seductive lifestyle of dirtbag skiers and snowboarders sacking it all off to go skiing in exotic sounding places like Telluride, Squaw Valley, and of course Chamonix. It was a vision of the North American take on skiing, which wasn't about money. It was about life, lifestyle. It was about how much you're up for blagging it. It made sense to us in the same way that skateboarding did, which might sound weird, but ultimately it was a different culture that we were hankering after. And, you know, we hankered after this in the same way that I also wished I could skate those nice, wide, smooth Californian pavements. For me, it was all part of the same package. It was a lifestyle that I wanted a piece of, basically. Suffice to say, I wore that tape out. And later, when I ended up doing Seasons in Chamonix with that same group of friends, we watched Blizzard of Oz countless times again. Those films just to make the point clear, had a direct influence on the life that I ended up living. There's a reason why my California trip last year, which was a pilgrimage, and which is basically what the book that I'm doing right now is about, included a stop in Squaw Valley, as well as in Encinitas. And that's all to do with Blizzard of Oz and Greg Stump. Anyway, as you might be able to tell, I'm a bit of a fan. And trigger warning, you're about to hear me in full gush mode. But I make no apologies for that. I mean, how often do you get the chance to chat to a legit hero and tell them what an impact their work made on your life? Pretty fucking rarely. So when the opportunity comes along, I'm going to take it. And I did. One final thing before we get to it, which should give you even more of an idea about what a legend we're dealing with. As ever trying to arrange this, I just emailed Greg out of the blue and asked him to come on the show. His reply was definitely the best I've ever had from a potential guest. It said, I'm Mancurian, excellent, 808 state country. I'm an egotist. Any new story about me is welcome. Let me know how I can help. Baron. When I got that email, I had a feeling this was going to be a good chat, and it was. And I'm also happy to report we have a new name-dropping champion. Sorry, Christian Stevenson, but until you can come up with a story 
up there with almost killing Seal in an avalanche, you are in second place. F definitely, finally, note on the sound. I used a new system to record this one called Zencaster. I'll talk a bit more about that at the end. It, it was great, but it meant no video. So there are a few bits where we interrupted each other, which I know does annoy some listeners. So apologies in advance, but I hope you can deal with it. That's enough of the longest intro ever. I'll be back at the end, but in the meantime, here's me and Greg Stump, legend of ours. Enjoy. So where are you calling from? Uh, I'm in Brighton in the UK. You went surfing in Brighton today? <laughs> I did, yeah. It was, uh, well, it wasn't great, but... Um, <laughs> Was it yeah, chilly? Br brisk. It was pretty chilly. Yeah. Well, it's wild. Um, do you surf? Very poorly. <laughs> yeah, I lived on Maui for quite a while. So I, I did surf, but I mean, yeah, I don't call myself a surfer. I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a geek. <laughs> yeah. So where, you, you know where Brighton is, right? So it's, it's up the English Channel. So we don't we don't really get any proper ground swell. We just get um, wind swell, really. So if you get a big if you get a big storm in the Atlantic, we get the the wind comes up the channel, creates these like junky wind swell waves. Um, so I was surfing that today, probably fifty mile an hour wind. I'm gonna say. Um, what type of dry suit do you use? Uh, so I had like a five four winter suit on today with. Um, yeah, full. No, I didn't. No gloves actually. Don't need gloves at the minute. Um, but boots, hood. Um, yeah, I mean it's a funny scene. It's there's like, there's, I'm going to say there's 80 guys in today, which you know, it's pretty wild, really, considering how Sunday morning. I guess it's the weekend, huh? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So where are you? You in Wyoming? Is that right? Well, I I used to be, but I'm that's where just where my phone is. I'm I'm in Central Oregon. Ah, okay. Right. Whereabouts? Uh, it's a little town called Primeville. It's about 45 minutes northeast of Bend. Okay. And, and it's uh, it's actually really beautiful. It's like high desert with water. And it's just this tiny town. And it was actually pretty, it was a pretty, uh, pretty destitute place about 15 years ago. And then 10 years ago, these two small uh, tech companies came here. Right. Yeah, I I always forget the names. Oh yeah, Apple and Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, might, I think I've heard of them. Yeah. <laughs> so between the two of them, they've got two point five million square feet of data center here. Wow. Okay. So it's kind of cool because we bought at the very bottom of the market, and uh, I've got two commercial properties here that we're remodeling, and uh, yeah, can't complain. Yeah. I'm getting older quicker. <laughs> Right. Uh, and so is that about, what, a couple of hours from Portland? I'm just trying to place the geography. Yeah, it's two and a half hours uh, northwest. Uh, if we dive northwest, so we're southeast of uh, Portland by about two and a half hours. But it's a really beautiful drive. I mean, you don't, you don't even hit a stoplight until you get, you know, into the suburbs of Bend. Uh, I love Oregon. I was there a year ago, and um, I, I was in Portland, actually, Doing, doing some podcasts. I was there for a week. Um, if I'd have known you were there, I would have driven two and a half hours to try to come and do it in person. But um, for some reason, I didn't I didn't think about the time. But I spent a week in Portland and then did one day, did the, the drive to the coast, um, went for a surf. And yeah, it was, it was stunningly beautiful, isn't it? Did you have good weather? You know what? We had really, really good weather. Um, we had, you know, th those real lovely crisp, like autumnal, brilliant blue skies, you know, cold, but crisp, um, like a good, good time to sort of see Portland, I think really. Yeah. That's a nice little city. I mean, it's kind of, everything's screwed up right now that, uh, you know, Portland was a, was, you know, basically on fire the whole summer. Yeah. Right. Sometimes. Yeah. It seemed like it was on the front line. Very much. Of this, uh, this here culture war you've got unfolding over there. Oh, and this crazy orange idiot, he won't, concede and he's just a freaking asshole so like oregon how did oregon vote in the end how did we and that how did we come here how did you vote in oregon like what was the state, oh, the state Oregon's, yeah very very liberal not 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 where i live but uh 
it's pretty redneck out here. Uh, yeah, I always got the impression you had like Portland as the kind of liberal epicenter, and then perhaps as you as you went out from that, um, it perhaps got a little bit started to drift a bit towards the right, maybe. Yeah, for sure. And once you get into the rural, uh, you know, they don't even want to be part of the like Eastern Oregon. They don't even want to be part of the state. They want to form their own state. Uh, ah, what like the kind of militia culture? Yeah, yeah. Not, not, it's, it's not to that here, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of ranchers. I mean, they're all really nice down to earth people, but I don't, uh, I don't ever talk politics. Out here. Yeah, right. <laughs> Best avoided. Try not to talk politics anyway, unless I really know the person. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good approach. Definitely. Have you seen, um, the documentary wild, wild country? Which ah, uh, you should watch it. It's set in um, you know, Central Oregon. It's about the uh, cult that was there in the seventies. Oh right. And it's one of those stories now that is is so dated. It's like when you look back at communism or the Berlin Wall or whatever, and you're like, wow, that is pre retro. When you look back at that, the idea that there was actually you know that was going on. This documentary is kind of like that. It's basically an Indian um, guru who shipped his cult out to the Oregon. Um, wilds and create a commune um and then it's 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 about like how that played out it's uh it's pretty fascinating just down the road from me it's like the next town over um yeah did you know that uh uh brad pitt his parents were in that cult no way i didn't know that yeah wow it's kept that one quiet <laughs> yeah you've seen once upon a time in hollywood right yeah, I love that film. I thought it was great. It's great, isn't it? I actually saw it tw- twice in the movie theater. I liked it so much. Yeah, so good. So good. I thought the ending was brilliant as well because I really wondered like how they were going to obviously handle the whole <laughs> Manson family <laughs> element to it. And I just thought it was so well done. I, I, I just always find that with his films, though. I just uh, I, I, I enjoy all of them. Yeah, I think he's my favorite. Yeah. My favorite director right now. He just doesn't miss. No. Definitely. Well, he's still, he's just got that unique, um, aesthetic as well, isn't he? You know, everything is like just complete standalone, which is brilliant. He used to, uh, he used to be the guy that, uh, he ran a video store in like Manhattan beach, California before he was famous. (laughs) That's the story, isn't it? They used to, used to binge all the old, like, you know, Italian spaghetti Westerns and that's where he got all the references from. Um, but yeah, Greg, thanks for chatting to me today. This is uh, it's a real privilege to, to speak to you. I mentioned in my email, um, which probably sounded quite funny to you, you know, kid from Manchester talking about the influence all these ski films had on him and his friends. Um, but yeah, like com- completely true story. And, and the other thing that really struck me about the email when you replied to me was, and you obviously clocked that I was from Manchester, you mentioned 808 State, which, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to choose one band from that era, it's quite a, you know, quite a considered choice. Is that is that your kind of genre? Well, I got turned on to 808 State through uh, Trevor Horn uh, because I was working. I, I had become friends with the Horn family, um, with Trevor and his wife and their kids. And, uh, and they, you know, because they, I'd been using their music in my pretty early films, uh, Maltese Flamingo, and then, uh, of course, Blizzard of Oz which was all that, you know, Frankie goes to Hollywood and, uh, you know, it was act, you know, propaganda. Um, and then for license to thrill, we ended up, ended up going to London and uh, remixing all the music that I had chosen. And a lot of it was 808 state and, and Graham, uh, I forget his last name, but he's one of the main guys And Graham. They were in London at the time. So I got to, you know, I got to meet those guys and hang out with them and we'd go to the pubs and, and yeah, so it was, it, uh, it was really cool. Um, but I, cause I didn't really know anything about the Manchester sound. Well, exactly. And that's why it kind of struck me because if you're gonna, you know, obviously, so I, I was, I was 14 in 1990. So like, you know, that was that for me, that whole, that music was this, you know, like my adolescence basically, but 808 state, like I say, 808 state, like I say, definitely more sort of cerebral end of that, of that scene. 
definitely. But I guess it makes sense with the, the ZTT connection. So that was one of the questions I was going to ask you, like, because, cause, you know, they're synonymous with your films, those soundtracks, particularly the Trevor Horn ZTT connection. So the story is that you basically approach them directly to use the music, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> exactly. Well, the true story is that I had, you know, before I got big, I'd used, um, I'd used a little bit of, uh, of ACT. I used one song from ACT uh, in Maltese Flamingo, and I actually didn't have permission. So I started getting, you know, and that, that movie started, I started getting big. And so I thought, well, I better go make friends with these people. So I, I called them up and, and uh, luckily for me, the very, the day I called, it was the very first day that this guy, Liam Teeling had begun working at, at ZTT because Jill, Sinclair, Trevor's wife had bought stiff records. And so Liam was the human asset that came with stiff records. So his very <laughs> first day, I know his very first day at work at ZT, ZTT, I happened to cold call from England, uh, from Maine. And he takes my call and it's a Tuesday. And he's like, uh, you know, so yeah, well, I can, I can see you on, uh, on Thursday. Can you be here on Thursday? And I'm like, absolutely. So I, you know, I, I was making money by then. So I, I just bought a ticket to London and showed up at their office and they were expecting, you know, cause I was getting really big press from powder magazine, big eight, eight page spreads. And they'd seen that too. So they were expecting, you know, some movie producer guy and I show up and I'm like this, as Jill put it, this fresh faced kid with a backpack and my posters and a VHS tape of, you know, the movies. Uh, did I lose you there, Matt? No, I'm still here. I'm sorry. I'm just, just letting it unfold. Okay. I thought that I, there was a hiss sound that went away. Anyway, uh, yeah, so I, I just, I show up there cold and I haven't got any money. And Liam, well, he ran it by Jill, unbeknownst to me. Because uh, Jill ran all the business for Trevor. His was wife. that was that Trevor's wife, right? Yeah, yes, yes. Who uh, met a very untimely end. Um, but uh, at that point, you know, she she kind of she okayed it that I and I didn't know that. And Liam comes comes back into the room where he'd left me, and uh, he loads me up with all this music, and he goes, "Stumpy, my boy, you can you can use all our music on one condition, <laughs> one condition only." Yeah, that the movie's great because otherwise it won't see the light of day. <laughs> and so this is, what's that? Well, I was going to say, so this is like before you cut Blizzard of Oz, is it? Yeah, exactly. So the ne so when I went back, uh, I had Blizzard of Oz finished, and I said, "Well, here it is," and they're like, "Oh, nice!" And, and the and the really great thing uh, was that record sales in England or in America rather from act propaganda and, and uh, was just act and propaganda at that point and, and some of the Frankie stuff, but in particular act and propaganda, because they're completely unknown in the States. You know, if they, it was, you know, MTV was going, but if you weren't on MTV and you didn't get radio airplay, it was, there's no way anybody would find out about you. Um, at that time so their record sales started ticking up in the states so they were seeing you know a direct cash payback for letting me use their music so it was kind of a match made in heaven heaven and we you know we continued on working together and i mean i was getting you know dat tapes of uh seal's first album before you know i knew one of the engineers and he i was just getting you know i was getting early early mixes of seal's first album that I used in Groove Requiem. It's funny to this day, you know, if I happen to talk to Seal, which is rare these days, but, uh, you know, back, back when we were hanging out a lot, because he used to come up to Whistler. Yeah, yeah. So once that's where we really spent a lot of time together was up there before he met Heidi and had kids and stuff. So he was single and I'd help him find his houses and get him as chefs. And, 
we'd go snowboarding together. But I, I kept telling him, you know, I, I said, Seal, you know, I've got these, I've got these mixes, or these acoustic mixes of crazy. He said, oh yeah, no, <laughs> they're on, they're on my acoustic album. And I'm like, no, they're not, not these. And he was like, oh yeah, they are, mate. I'm like, okay. Yeah. And I, you can only argue with Seal so much. And it's That's useless. brilliant. Do you know that he was he was the first guy on the cover of a European snowboarding magazine called Onboard? I don't know if you know that title. But Yeah, um, I do. Cecile was on the first cover, randomly enough. I wonder if he knows that. I don't know if he knows that. He was also on the cover of Ski Magazine here, and he was the first snowboarder to be on the cover of Ski Magazine. And, so there you go. So there's two absolute kind of firsts, really, because mm. that's so funny. Well, he told me after Groove Requiem came out, and that was sort of it was before I knew him, but he was just starting to snowboard, and he was living in Los Angeles, and he'd go to the snowboard shops, and these people kept coming up to him and going, hey, man, I love your stuff in Greg Stump's new movie. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. And <laughs> so many people kept coming up to him that he finally calls his manager. He goes, what bloody ski movie are we in? And the manager's like, oh, it's just this tiny little thing that, it's one of Trevor's friends. It's no big deal. He goes, well, I think it is a big deal because everybody keeps coming up to me. I go to Mammoth and it's just nonstop. Groove Requiem, Groove Requiem. Love you, Greg Stump, Greg Stump. So that's finally, he's, he sought me out. He was playing in Vancouver and he called me. Right. And, uh, you know, of course I was just thrilled and we went down to the show and, and you know, I got to go backstage and everything, got to meet him. And, and then, he, then he came up to Whistler the next day and, we started snowboarding together and it was a really fun, really fun time. You know, I got to spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with him. It was, it was great. I almost, I almost killed him a couple of times. Uh, oh yeah. What? Right. We had one in particular. Oh God. It was this really wet, wet, big, deep, you know, powder day, probably two, to two or three feet of, of big wet avalanche snow. And, I say to Henry, you want to, you want to go for a hike? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the ski patrol, they let Henry and I go up because it's me and seal. And they're like, you got, a, you got an eye on him. Right. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we hike all the way up the top of Whistler, this, up this cat track. And, uh, you know, by the time he gets up there, he's, he's pretty beat. You know, he's a big boy and he's got hard boots. And anyway, there's nobody up there. It's, it's, you know, if it, and when I get to the top of this one bowl and I, I slide into it and I hear this big thunk and I'm like, fuck, this baby's going to go and we're going to, they'll never find us till tomorrow. So I, I'm like, Henry, you, you got to follow me. We got to go over to those rocks over there. We have to hug these rocks. But why? I want to ski the powder. <laughs> I won't ride the powder. <laughs> just, you, 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 just, you have to come with me over here, you know. And it's just, it's just murderous keeping, you know, because you're side slipping down, you know, probably a thousand vertical down the edge of this bowl, you know. And we get to the bottom, and he goes, "Why? Well, why didn't we ski?" And I said, "Because that thing was going to slide on us." And, oh, you know, I didn't really understand it. Yeah, I was going to say probably because I think I've, I've definitely had a few of those situations where you've been with friends that just like blissfully unaware of you know what's actually going on and you just kind of concentrate on getting them down no and then he was so tired that we got you know we got to these places where you you have to straight run it to you know make it across this frozen flat pond and i'm like henry you gotta you can really carry your speed and and you know i went first and carried my speed and got all the way across and of course he fucking does you know a triple cartwheel right before hitting the pond so now he's got a post hole up to his nads yeah you know with his snowboard off and, and, oh definitely you know, make you more tired <laughs> oh yeah he, you know he's just you know he's a big boy and so he's post holing it and just just had the shittiest freaking time and i i thought he was gonna kill me you know <laughs> at, the, at the end i you know i get i get down to where we're gonna download the lift and uh and we're in the line and, and I go, you did really great up there because he did considering what we just avoided and what, what didn't happen. I said, you did really great up there. And he's like, if that's your idea of reverse psychology, it's not working. 
<laughs> and he's freaking steam coming. I thought he was going to freaking clock me. And we get, we get into the gondola, uh, and one of his like bodyguard buddies met up with us at that point. So there's three of us get into the gondola, and I'm like, and his buddy even thought he's going to fucking kill Greg. You know, he's that angry. And then these two little girls get into the the gondola to download. It's like six passenger <laughs> gondola. And the little girls get in, and within a couple of minutes. You know, nobody's saying anything. And little, the little, one little girl goes, Mister, what's wrong with your face? <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and Seals, Buddy, and I are just like, okay, this is, here comes, this is it. He's going to blow. Um, and instead, Seal was very, very kind to the little girls and said, yeah, it's called lupus. You know, because I ne- obviously never asked him. And, you know, you re- was, at the time, he was pretty famous and we're, you know, you'd read it with you know, tribal markings or, you know, you remember all that stuff. But lupus, you know, so, but he calmed down. But I don't know what would have happened if those little girls hadn't got in. Yeah, diffused it. So did, totally. he, let, did, he, did he let you take, take him out again after that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, he, he, was, he was funny because we... Sure, we go snowboarding, and I was on soft boots, and he was on hard boots, and you know, I was a pretty good snowboarder at that point. And, and he was like, "Well, you you can do it better because you're on soft boots." And I'm like, "Okay, now we want me to get hard boots tomorrow, and we'll be more even." So I did, and it, you know, of course, it doesn't make any difference. I'm you know, I've been snowboarding for three years at Whistler, and <laughs> so it's just you know, 140 days a year. So anyway, you know, he, but he's a he's a good ad, but he's kind of a what do we what do we call you guys that when you complain the whinging pommies? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, we're all, we're all that. We've all got that in us. Yeah. I, I mean, on the snowboarding thing, that was one of the things I wanted to ask you because I'm I'm a snowboarder. I did learn to ski. I learned to ski on a plastic dry slope in the north of England, um, and then learned to snowboard on a on a plastic dry slope as well. And you know, obviously, one of the things that's really notable when you look back at your films now is that how like inclusive to snowboarding they were you know from day one you were obviously just like yep that's in which was which was not the prevailing story at the time obviously you know the ski industry by and large i'm in the mid 80s mid late 80s had a real problem with snowboarding so how come you were so how come you spotted it so early and and you were just so accepting of it well because well first of all i was a freestyle skier which was you know we were always looked down upon by the racers anyway. So I was kind of used to that shit. Um, but the big thing was I was sponsored by Swatch. Um, and Swatch early on, I mean, the very first time I saw a half pipe was at Lance Mountain's backyard. And, you know, I, was, I filmed Tony Hawk when he was 16. Um, yeah, so Swatch sponsored skateboarding and, and then snowboarding right away. So, uh, and Swatch sponsored my movie. So I, it was just a natural... Uh, you know, basically my sponsor sponsored the world snowboarding championships, the very first one. So, uh, I, that's why I was there. Um, and plus it, you just, you could, that's where the kids were. It's where the girls were. It was where all the, you know, the hipness was, it was what freestyle skiing used to be when it first started. Uh, it was cool. So it, it just made sense. And so I, and, and then when I, I actually started snowboarding myself. It was at Whistler and this was before fat skis. And, uh, you know, Whistler, you know, it's basically three different climate zones. You know, your, your high Alpine is powder. The mid mountain will be a, a, you know, a really thick wet snow. And then the bottom half often can be raining and, and corn snow. So the snowboard was a, you know, superior, uh, tool compared to skinny skis. Skinny skis were really difficult. But soon thereafter, you know, fat skis started coming around. Um, but I got into fat skis uh, because one of Warren Miller's cameraman, Gary Nate, said, Stumpy, you got to try these fat skis. And he knew about them from Wiggly's, the heli skiing stuff. But the reason we we liked it as cameramen is because, I mean, my pack was 75 pounds. And I'm, I'm not a big guy. I'm like 5'5", you 5'6". Know, five, 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 uh, so the... The, the fat, the wide skis allowed me to get around in that pan. I was getting around in the pack anyway in the Alps on skinny skis, skinny 207s. Uh, so the fat ski was 
just a godsend. It was, you know, twice as easy. It was, you know, half as much work. And, you know, then I started skiing on them every day, just regularly. I didn't even use a pair of regular skis ever again. I still don't. Um, well, obviously now, but I mean, you know, so for, for Whistler, you know, snowboarding, and plus the snowboard scene at the Whistler was really exploding. You know, it was definitely the epicenter of North America. Um, you know, and then we had, the, you know, the, the great summer camps up there. And, uh, and, you know, so I, and I knew Craig Kelly, you know, early on. Yeah, you filmed Craig, didn't you? Yeah, quite a bit. And we, we did a, we did that movie. I don't know if you've seen Siberia. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a long time ago, that's the thing. A lot of your, you know, you're probably across it, but a lot of your films aren't, you know, most things you can see on YouTube, but I couldn't really find it. I was trying to watch it. I'll give you a promo code so you can go in and digitally download it. Anyway. Oh, that'd be brilliant. Yeah. I'd love to see that again. It's been years, but yeah, I mean, Craig, you know, to, what, what privilege to be able to, to film someone like that in the prime. Oh, it was great. And, uh, you know, I, what a tragedy. I, I know, I mean, I know exactly where I was when I got the phone call. Yeah. I remember where I was incalculable loss. Yeah. No. And I, I we, we got, we were good friends. You know, we didn't see each other a lot, but when we did, it was, you know, it was one of those friends that you just pick right up where you left off. <laughs> but yeah, I was on Maui, just driving across the Island on Maui and my agent in LA called me and said, did you hear about the avalanche in BC? And I went, no, I go, he goes, yeah, 12 people dead. And I go, anybody we know? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, who? It was Craig. I'm like, oh, fuck me. Yeah. I actually drove back to my studio and I put on Siberia. I just shut the door, turned off the lights, and put on Siberia and cried for about <laughs> a day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it didn't it didn't seem real, did it? You know, out of, out of every, I mean, I, I didn't know him, obviously. You no, know, for me, he was just, you know, one of these mythical figures, really. Through, through the culture that you know and, and obviously as we know his place was particularly mythical especially in snowboarding um but even even at that remove it, it felt it didn't feel real it was just like god not him you know like for, just seemed just seemed like such a huge loss basically he was no dummy either. he was a very very smart guy like he was a physics major and every time i went anywhere with him he always had his nose buried in a book he's always reading very cerebral uh just uh, you know he just you know he's like schmidt he's, he's just real there's no pretense there's no you know they, i'm sure he has an ego because you know he knew how good he was but he, he didn't he never flaunted it or, or he was a very humble guy really liked him yeah yeah so you mentioned your background as a skier you know clearly but you know before before the filmmaking obviously you were you were a talented free skier and freestyle skier sorry as you mentioned and you shot with warren miller right was that was that the case like that was that your kind of into filmmaking yeah i did one sequence in one film for warren miller but i i had done a major movie and star i was one of the three stars of vagabond skiers which was dick barrymore's last movie and that was made in 1970. He's a great hero of yours, right? Yeah, very much. And, uh, but I mean, I scammed my way into the Warren Miller movie because I knew I was going to try to make a ski movie that year. So I thought, well, what better way to promote myself than to get into a Warren Miller movie? <laughs> and I, I know I did. And, and actually in the, in Steve, the Warren Miller story, because <laughs> once, once I started getting big and he realized what I had done, that I tricked him. He, when they released that, ski time uh, film from whatever it was 82 83 when they released that on vhs warren went back in the studio and re-recorded my name so i went from greg stump freestyle champion to uh greg stottlemyer uh, uh, avocado farmer from yucca that's hilarious right yeah so he, he, went, he never he, he denied it when i interviewed him he denied doing it and i, I didn't want to push it but that's well. so good though there's something brilliant about that isn't there like you know to actually take the time to do that is is so bloody minded uh, they got they got tricked hook line and sinker yeah so that was calculated so you were like right i'm gonna i'm gonna need some promo so i might as well get in the biggest film yeah yeah and and, and after skiing for barrymore you know there was it was easy you know i had i had sponsors so it didn't cost them anything and i just wormed my way into a shoot 
Right. But you had the you had the wider goal, which was to make your own film at this point. Oh yeah. No, I I I was already starting it. And I, I knew when they that they would be coming out right when I released my first movie. <laughs> and when when you you know, I've obviously done a fair bit of research, know a lot know, know a lot of your story. And when you go back and read some of the interviews and, and the articles and stuff, it it kind of suggests that you felt there was a, a definite gap for the type of film you ended up making that was essentially progressive and modern in comparison to the sort of status quo ski films at that time. Is it was it that calculated, or is or is it no, just very, become very much. No, it, right? It totally was well because again, being you know being a, a champion freestyle competitor, I you know all I, all the people I knew, kids were better skiers than these same old farts that were in the Warren Miller movies, and at the time it was just Warren Miller. Everybody else had had quit. So he was my only target and, you know, his Achilles heel was his music. Uh, by yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty style, wasn't it? Yeah, it was all needle drop, canned. And, you know, then I come blazing out of the you know, gates, of, you know, Frankie goes to Hollywood and propaganda and act. And it's, it's just mind blowing because, and the only way I could have done that is, is it was just because Trevor and Jill and Liam liked me. Well, they probably like they probably liked your, um, y- you know, your front as well. They must have done to to sort of because I can't imagine. Yeah, you know, it's a couple of things to say. Like ZTT, I mean, you forget now, but they were fucking massive, weren't they? I mean, you know, pretty much biggest label in the world in the mid eighties. Well, Trevor was producer of the year. Yeah, I mean, the huge, 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 you know, concern label producer. ABC, Grace Jones. Um, yeah, yeah, unbelievable. I mean, what a run. You know, Frankie in this country definitely changed the, 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 the wider culture, you know. So bringing it back, you know, they must have, they're probably quite tickled by the fact that some American ski kid comes over and is like, you know, can, do you want to be involved in this? No, they, they loved it. And, you know, as Liam told me, because, you know, money will never change hands. You just keep doing what you're doing. And uh, because, you know, had Warren Miller gone to ZTT Records, they would have won, you know, 100 grand a track or, you know, what, you know, so Warren was limited because he was too big to get popular music. And I maintain that, you know, they would have known what to get anyway. Because even when his son bought the company and then they started, you know, doing what I was doing and getting music, they, they still, I don't know how they managed to pick these horrible songs, but, you know, <laughs> they, they, they pick, you know, they, from, they'd have these artists they were working with and they just still pick these fucking feds of music. So, you know, you can lead a horse to water, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Joe and Trevor and Liam, they were, well, they were very, very proud to, to have music in my movies and, you know, and then, you know, my stuff started taking off in Europe and then they were, then they're just, you know, tickled pink, you know, and, uh, the, the Trevor and then his family, they used to come to Whistler too and they'd rent a house. And, yeah, it was great. We, no, I mean, I remember sitting on the lift many times with my dad and Trevor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah that would, and, you know, we'd go to dinner at their house. I mean, that one night there was like a, 15 person dinner and you know my dad and my stepmom and you know it's great fun it was, it was really great you know, because it, we became we all became friends and then the same deal i you know when i go to london i'd go out to hook end and my friend and i we'd stay out there at uh that beautiful hook end that 15th century estate that they bought from uh david and happy gilmore from pink floyd yeah, it was a really cool place. It was haunted as shit, too. Um, <laughs> you know, like Morris, Morris he used to go out there to, to record just because it was haunted. And uh, Oh, I dreamt about that place before I ever stepped foot on it. Oh, that's amazing. It was the strangest thing. I, I yeah. had this absolutely strange, vivid, bizarre dream about a year before I went to Hook End. And Jill was giving me a tour of the old part of the house, and I'm going, I'm just like, oh, I'm just going, oh my God, this is the house in my dream. And I said to her, I go, Jill, if there's a pendant 
there's a round stone pendant out the side of this front door. I'm going to freak out. Just, well, there is. <laughs> there is. Come look. And I'm like, okay. And ironically, that's where she was uh, shot. I don't know if you know what happened to her. but No, I don't know the story. Yeah, her son was target practicing with an air rifle and she somehow he didn't I don't know didn't see her something but she got hit right in the aorta oh god um, and basically went into a coma and, and died eight years later but you know she lived in a coma for eight years just a miserable horrible end oh what an awful story yeah no and she was a really good friend of mine we people used to joke with me you know Jill doesn't have any other male friends right <laughs> but the new because his people she was just feared in the record business she was very very feared you know i mean frank frank eventually sued them you know holly johnson yeah well it all went it all kind of in the classic music industry fashion all got quite bitter didn't it by the end yeah but you know jill would she'd sign you know they, when they signed frankie they're completely unknown and you know there's nobody in that band that played a single instrument the only thing from that band is Holly Johnson singing. You know, the band's Trevor Horn and Steve Lipson. And uh, I forget the percussionist's name, Louis Jardim. You know, and then <laughs> it was just, like they, when, when the Frankie went on Tops of the Pops, they had to rehearse them for a week so that they could pretend, like, pretend to play their instruments. <laughs> wow, that's hilarious. So when I got, I've got a geeky one about about the process that you, when you were using this this music then, so because it one you know I watched I rewatched Blizzard of Oz a couple of nights ago, and again one of the things and it's it's got to be a good decade since I've watched it, but one of the things that really stands out is is just how well the music fits and you know if you look at the Chamonix section if you look at the Cool War section like Warriors of the Wasteland like the way you've cut it with the music is is so like amazingly well done and it's still like i say today you watch it it, it still works i actually sent it to a friend of mine who'd never seen it and he was like what the fuck is this you know like it it, it has that effect yeah, yeah so like what what was coming first were you we were, were you doing the classic like going away getting loads of footage and fitting it afterwards or did you have the track in mind and then you did you put the footage around the track if you know what i mean like how, how did the process work well, Blizzard was my fifth movie, and the first four movies, because I was a radio DJ, so I had uh, quite a bit of experience uh, doing audio production. So the first four movies, I actually made the entire soundtrack of the film, my narration, everything, and, and, and I was unable to, you know, I couldn't change it because it was all linear, and I just pasted pictures to it. See, that was that went first. So you had the, the voiceover and the soundtrack. That was that was the starting point. At, at, at first, the first five movies. But then by Blizzard of Oz, I was able to afford uh, an offline editing system. So I could actually make multiple edits before I went into the online studio. Um, and even, the, yeah, I think I did have some of the songs in mind, but, you know, being in Europe and Chamonix and just, you know, I, I did have propaganda because I remember walking around my Walkman listening to propaganda, but that's, you know, it was just before Blizzard that I got all the, the free music from ZTT. And so I, I did have, you know, I had a lot of the music picked out. I didn't necessarily know what sequence I was going to use, but you know, I did, I did, I did know that, you know, once the movie got to Europe, uh, that, you know, that European ZTT sound, uh, you know, it's just, it was perfect you know, because again, people here in the States, they hadn't heard of any of that music and they didn't really know, you know, it was so cutting edge, uh, that it gave, you know, it gave the movie, it, I mean, it really, really helped drive that movie, like, the music for sure. Oh, completely. Yeah. I mean, you, you say, you say the film and you think of the soundtrack, definitely. And the other thing that, that really leaps out as well, what rewatching Blizzard is the narrative. I mean, it's got a narrative, it's got a story. And again, the story stands up and even now, 30 years later, it's still really rare. You know, like most ski, snowboard, surf, skate films, you can think of a few that have got a, a narrative that works. 
but mostly it's trick porn. Mostly it's just bang, 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 trick, trick, trick. And, you know, Blizzard like has a coherent narrative. It still completely stands up. Like, I guess it's a similar question. Like, was that something that evolved through the filming or again, did you have, did you have that plan in mind from the beginning? Yeah. And I, I'd, I'd seen a windsurf movie because I was heavily into windsurfing and I'd, I'd go to Maui and, and there was a windsurf movie called uh, The Impact Zone by a guy named uh, Jonathan Weston. And he had the athletes talking. And I thought, oh boy, there it is. That's what I'm going to do next. You know, I'm going to have, I'm gonna, so I was basically imitating a, a windsurf movie that I'd seen where, you know, the athletes were you know, interviewed very much like I did in Blizzard. Uh, so, you know, I, that was, there was a format that I, I was imitating. Um, and that was, uh, that was this windsurf movie. Uh, so yeah, it was definitely, I was definitely on to making the, uh, the skiers talk. Um, and, and actually I was so embarrassed of the narration in Blizzard of Oz because it got so big so quickly, you know, when you listen to my French, French pronunciations, I mean, I just cool wah you know i just butcher stuff <laughs> well we one, one of our cat one of our catchphrases when we lived in chamonix was was murray ball at the at the top of the agree chamonix what, you know, whatever it is he says um like that was that was literally we i did a lot of seasons in chamonix and that was our that was our catchphrase you know like and the other, the other thing that's hilarious now is grand monte being untracked four days after a storm i mean these 10 10 minutes these days but uh but yeah but it's it's brilliant though like the the the, the voiceover and it is what makes it you know there's a lot of real sound like you know when we're you hear the ice axe you know when you we're going through the little tunnel at the top of the agui uh and then, you know and even you know scott schmidt we i mean he had a we had a tape deck on him <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right yeah we had you know we had a, he had he had a tape deck on a little cassette player and so you know hearing the athletes but i was so embarrassed in that narration because i thought you know who the fuck am i telling everybody the... i i just i thought it was too bragged you know too much bragging it was too uh so and that's why there was no there's no narration in license to thrill which is the following really? that's so that's so interesting can we can can we dig into that a little bit like so why why did you feel it was it was too um you know, use the word braggadocio, but what, what, where was that feeling coming from? Because you felt that it was disrespectful to everybody that already knew about Chamonix, like all the people, all the, 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 the existing extreme scene. Yeah, kind of that. And I, I just was so uh, sure in my narration, you know, these guys are the best. Scott Schmidt, Mike Catcher, Glenn, Play, you know, and, and Scott maybe was, but even then, you know, there is, this is you know, there's a lot of good. It just felt like I was bragging about something I wasn't an expert in. And, so, and, and I really started feeling strange when I would read stuff in ski magazines that I made up. <laughs> that wasn't true. <laughs> and then this bullshit that I was spewing suddenly becomes fact. And I'm just like, okay, this is, you, you got to cool your jets here. This is not right. That's when you know you're at the cutting edge of the zeitgeist there, though. You're like, even, yeah. even, even the bullshit is, uh, is sticking. <laughs> no, you know, like, yeah, yeah. I mean, stuff that, that I made up in the, it was in the narration. I started reading in, in you know, Powder Magazine and the, the Ski Magazine. So I'm like, this is, this is screwed up. I, I became embarrassed of my narration especially because the movie got so big so quickly. I mean, we were on the Today Show four months after Blizzard came out. It just was meteoric. Um, so I thought, well, you know, and, but it, it was kind of a blessing in disguise because it forced me to really go with, because the skiers told the story in License to Thrill. You know, I don't narrate it. They, they do. And I really liked that. And I kind of went crazy with Dr. Strange Glove because I was, finally in a relationship with a hot chick and probably smoking way too much weed and I screwed up that movie. But then I took, then I moved to Whistler and 
I took a, I took three years off and it was the first time in six years that I took some time off and wasn't making a ski movie every year because, you know, people were always like, whoa, it must be so great. You get to ski all the time. I was like, no, I don't. I'm on skis, but I'm not skiing. I'm carrying a 75 pound pack and, you know, changing cans of film in a black bag, with my bare hands on freezing cold pig iron. Um, yeah, it's not, gla- it's not glamorous at all. It's not glamorous. No, but- I'm, I'm glad I did it because, you know, and plus we grab, we hauled around, you know, way more advanced camera gear than Warren Miller or anybody. The Europeans were using it, like uh, Apocalypse Snow people. They were using good cameras, but Warren Miller, they were just using, I mean, their most elaborate camera was an RES, which is a little hundred foot load. You know, it's a great little camera, but, you know, I, I had an RES R. You know, the 12 to 240 lens, power zoom. Um, you know, it had, you know, my real time was, was you know, it had a side card that was crystal synced. It was real, real time. So my, my real time was, was real. And, you know, it was a much more cinematic uh, look that I was getting, but it was because I was lugging all that shit around. You know, and, it, you know, I eventually blew my back out years later from camera gear carrying that stuff but back to being at whistler so moving to whistler you know i bought a condo really cheap right at the base the old the old old whistler base area before it was developed and i mean i could walk the lifts and i just skied up you know 140 days a year for two three years and then then i, I got the itch to make a movie again and, I, and then i made groove requiem in the key of ski with seal and then that kept, blows up huge um but, you know, I, didn't, I soon realized that somebody was going to die in front of my lens. I kept going this direction and I just wasn't willing. I didn't want to be, I, I couldn't have lived with myself, you know. And I, I'm good friends with Steve, Steve Winter and I interviewed him about, you know, Shane McConkey. And I mean, this was about a year and a half later and still broke into tears, you know. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, well, then the weird thing about that, he, he have you seen Legend of Oz? Uh, yes, yes, I have. Yeah, brilliant. Love the Re- Lenny Riefenstahl stuff at the beginning as well. Well, it's so great to sort of contextualize all that. Yeah, thank you. I like like that. Well, when you, I, I, I get you this promo code because download the Blizzard of Oz 30th anniversary edit because I took out the stuff that had been bothering me. Namely, oh, really? Cookie the Swede was is gone. Cookie's uh, gone. No cookie's way. Gone. No, cookie's gone. And uh, a couple of the, there was something goofy I kept doing. Uh, uh, Wheel of Destruction. Yeah, that. Wheel of Destruction. That's gone. Uh, and then I, I put sort of a, a little bit of a historical perspective on the new beginning that this was my fifth film. Because, you know, most people didn't know I'd done four movies before Blizzard. Um, and, and then a, a really good ending on it. So I'll, but you can, and you can download that when you, when you go there. But yeah. But we had a really good tour with it in uh, 2018. We toured all over the country and the shows out here in the West were really good, really fun. Well, you must be so proud now, like obvious thing to say, but you know, the impact, you know, the fact that we're having this conversation 30 odd years later and it, you know, it, it genuinely, did have a huge impact on my life which is you know she's wild isn't it you know so for, for this film that you've made obviously i think again the story that i've heard you tell is you knew it was good you know you kind of knew you had something that was probably gonna be more successful than anything that you'd ever done before but you couldn't have possibly known or guessed at the cultural impact it was going to have so when when you look back now like yeah well i did know it was going to be big I, in fact when I got back from Chamonix, I sat down with my best friend and I showed him exactly how the film was were to be put together should something happen to me. Like if I got hit by a bus, he was he made a deal with me that he was gonna put the movie together. This is this is how he was gonna do it. Because I, I did I did know I had I I had something really big. Um, but nobody else did, like Scott Schmidt. He'll tell you this day, he goes, I didn't think there was going to be anything. He didn't, he didn't think we had enough footage. Um, and we did, but I... That's, that's classic athlete, though, isn't it? 
<laughs> no, never got enough footage. Yeah, well, and, and you know, Scott, he he had not filmed with me before because my movies pre Blizzard were pretty goofy, and you know, it was all bump skiing and it was bump skiing. And he's Warren Miller guy, right? Yes. Yeah. But uh, you know, I mean, he'll tell you today that that movie did more for his career than all the Warren Miller movies combined. So how you know how do you feel about that now? That impact when you when you look back. Um, it's great. You know, I mean, it's fabulous. I think I'm the only one of that whole crew. It's not a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody else, like Glenn and Scott, they made, they made out like they, they're both very wealthy guys now. Um, and you know, I mean, made money off it and it still sells today, but I mean, I, I pack the, I put, you know, I, I signed the DVDs, put them in the bag. Go down to the post office. <laughs> but uh, no, it's great. And, and it led to so many things. I mean, I ended up getting a really good agent in Hollywood. I started doing, uh, you know, commercial work, which was, you know, which was awesome. It was really lucrative. And I mean, I ended up, I, I directed a Super Bowl commercial for Disney in 2001. Wow. There you go. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I ended up having a really good commercial career. But mostly, you know, it, it, it got me to a place where, I mean, I haven't had a regular job, you know, since I worked at the radio station when I was, you know, 20 years old. So, because, you know, I started making, you know, making movies when I was 23. And then once Blizzard came out, it was, you know, and you're, you're kind of, all, or at least in my case, I, I was sort of the last guy to know. That's something that was really big. Um, you know, because I was on to the next thing. Yeah, sure. You were like you were already like forgetting about it and, and moving on. Yeah, and I and I didn't like the narration. I didn't think it was that that great. It's not it's not my favorite movie that I've made. Yeah, I've heard you say that before. Groove Requiem and Pizza Slides and Duct Tape and Siberia. Fistful of Moguls even. Fistful of Moguls is is pretty good. And that's because you know, Glenn and I split up after License to Throw. We just couldn't stand each other. Well, there's that story pre-Blizzard as well where it sounds, and again, I'm interested in, in how true this one is, like that you didn't actually, you know, he was a late addition to the lineup for Blizzard, right? Oh, yeah. I didn't want him on my, I didn't want him in Europe on my watch. You know, I was very conscious of not being the ugly American um, when I traveled in Europe. And that's not just from the ski movies, but I, I did a semester at uh, King Alfred's College in Winchester, and uh, my father was uh, very involved in. Uh, well, his dissertation for his PhD was on the censorship of the British stage, so he was very uh, in with the sort of elite acting crowd. I mean, he went to Laurence Olivier's 80th birthday party, and uh, you know, he, he he had a lot of a lot of friends in the, in the British stage scene. So, uh, I would, you know, I, I was in a couple of college touring productions in England. So I'd spent a lot of time in London, Winchester. Um, so I, you know, I was very, once I started making the ski movies, I was just really, really very conscious about nobody in my crew be the ugly American. And so I didn't want Glenn there. Uh, as in like the loud, kind of uncouth stereotype of an American tourist. It's Donald Trump in England. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's imagine, just what he, imagine what he would have been like as you know, a 20-year-old. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. Enough, enough said. And, uh, right. Yeah, and that was what you were worried bad about. Bad. That, was, that, that was what you were worried about with Glenn. Totally. Uh, and for good reason. Because at that point, Glenn was you know, still doing cocaine drinking like a freaking fish and you know he just was a mess uh and and even in the states i didn't want him around i I just couldn't deal with it i I just couldn't deal with it because you know like we'd be at snowbird you know and here i am you know i'm I'm at snowbird i get you know comp they're giving us rooms they're giving us free tickets we're their guests and you know i walk into to the lobby of the cliff lodge and snowbird and i smell weed this is freaking Utah back then, right? 
you know, Utah, fucking Mormons and shit. And I've just gone, please, please, please don't let that be coming from one of our rooms. You know, get in the elevator. It's even worse. Get to our floor. It's I'm like, fuck. Sure enough, there's Glenn, you know, bonk, you know, doing bong hits in, in, you know, the comp hotel room. And, you know, it was that kind of shit. I just was like, fuck that. I don't need that. I, I definitely don't need that in Europe. Uh, but then Lynn got hurt. Like the very first day we're shooting in Chamonix and breaks her back. And, uh, well, even, even before that, like I couldn't figure out, Glenn would show up all over the West, wherever we were, Squaw Valley, Snowbird. Yeah, because I was going to ask you about Squaw, because obviously in the film, it, you edit it as if Squaw is the kind of Europe shootout. So presumably that was retrofitted. Like if if he if he came, you know, if he came after this thing happened in Chamonix. So what you'd done a shoot with him in Squaw before that you could then use in the film? We had shot that sequence already at, at Squaw. I, and I wasn't even there. I was shooting something else in Colorado. And Bruce Benedict was the single camera that shoot that day. Um, and he Bruce shot that whole sequence and and so, because I, again, I didn't want to deal with Glenn. I'm like, you want to film play? Like, go ahead. Have at it. Have fun. Um, but Glenn kept showing up with all the right gear. And I'm like, who the fuck is telling him where we're going? And it turned, <laughs> out, to be, it turned out to be my partner, my marketing guy, Carl Labby. So behind my back, because he thought, he knew Glenn was going to be a star. And he's like, no, you got to have more of the plate guy. You got, you know, and I'm like, you yeah, know, well, you go live with him on the road. But he kept telling him where we were. So that's, and Glenn would show up, but like we we didn't see that Squaw Valley footage because you know it's film, and you know film had to get sent to Los Angeles to the lab, get developed, then get telecined. Um, I would telecine it to one inch videotape and have you know three quarter inch submasters, but we didn't see that footage of the Squaw Valley shootout until we were in Chamonix, uh, and I got these three quarter inch tapes. And the only pl- place that had a three quarter inch machine that I knew of in France was Solomon in, in Annecy. And uh, so we went down to their you know, corporate theater and we watched that footage. And when it's done, we're all just kind of gasping. And Glenn looks at me and goes, slap a cover on it. <laughs> you know, There's your movie, Brilliant. right? Slap a cover on it. So we, we didn't see it till we were in Chamonix, but, you know, knowing that I had that, you know, in my quiver, in the can, uh, then, you know, then we're, you know, I could, then I, I retroactively, you know, built the, you know, again, and that's another thing about Blizzard, you know, because the, the, the shootout at Squaw Valley, like it, there was no shootout. There was no, there was no... There was no tryouts. There was, but that's the that's the story, though, isn't it? That's why it's so great. That's what I mean. Like that's 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 what I love about it. The fact it's completely that you, fabricated. But even this this makes it better. This makes it even better because, like, people just don't do that. And like I know I'm repeating what I said earlier, but it still doesn't happen. Or if it does happen, it's just shit. Like you know, it's so hard to do well. Like to actually to to put this type of lasting stamp on a skier or snowboard film it's just not easy so I, I love that that's brilliant so what what was um what was he like on the hill though not to make this like the tell me about glenn show but i you know like you've you've mentioned you had concerns about his professionalism presumably when he was skiing he was pretty on it uh oh yeah you know he, he was a great you know he was great and he he instinctively knew how to ski for the camera um, same thing with Schmidt. Um, pretty well, you know, all my skiers were because uh, not not with Glenn, but with my other skiers. Early on, I was shooting on video uh, the first couple of years, so it was a great learning curve because that you know we could watch it all at, that night. But no, Glenn, you know, Glenn had a feel for the camera. He's you know he's a natural showman. He's uh, you know he's to this day, to this day he's. He's just an absolute natural showman. And, you know, I'd say about 50% of the shit that comes out of his mouth, even now, is not true. <laughs> and uh, 
I just, you know, and, and after Blizzard, I just, I just had it. I couldn't, I, I was like, fuck it. I'm not dealing with this guy anymore. Even after Blizzard, you know, and uh, it was funny. We were at this, uh, we did a screening of the Blizzard 30th at Squaw Valley uh, in 2018 in the spring. And it was a big, you know, panel Q and A thing. And uh, it was me and Glenn, Mike, Scott, and Lynn Wyland. And I just couldn't believe it. Glenn starts actually taking credit for, you know, Seal and helping launch Seal's career. And this is like, that was four years after we had, we hadn't even spoken in four years. And I'm just sitting there, I'm just sitting there looking at him going, I cannot believe you're taking ownership of this. And then at one point he said something, you know, Bruce Benedict who shot all Greg's movies. And I, and I just blurred out, but right in front of, in front of everyone, I'm like, what the fuck did you just say? I said, well, you shot, you, you, you directed the photography. I go, Glenn, there were two cameramen and you weren't one of them. You know, it's like, don't, how, how can you say, Bruce shot all my movies. Oh, okay. You know, it's like, he just blurts shit out. It's not true. He's like Trump. He's totally like <laughs> Trump. Pathological. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, he's, Thankfully, he doesn't drink anymore, so he's not, you know, mean and doesn't, you know, fall asleep on your floor and pee his pants. Glenn actually let, at the Baltics Flamingo premiere, he came to my condo in Maine uh, and fell passed out on the floor with these bright yellow bad boy club pants on, bright yellowy orange, and he pissed himself. And, <laughs> and the next morning, there's this huge urine stain orange urine stain but it was in the shape of like a crotch like zippers and buttons and that's hilarious you, oh it was hilarious yeah let me tell that's, you my brand new berber carpet in my condo gets urinated on by mr clay <laughs> oh he, you know he'd be i think he threw up out the window of the car at that premiere and i'm just like god fuck this i can't handle it there is a great story though uh, from that that same shoot glenn um He's, he's some, for some reason, he's gone up to, up, up the coast with, like, a, with some of my friends in, in, in a, in a, in a, a rent-a-car or something, and they, they get pulled over. And Glenn's, you know, just, of course, spoke in pot and in the car, and, the, you know, the state, he smells the weed, and I, I guess Glenn was driving. I don't know what the deal was. And anyway, he gets Glenn out of the car, and he says, he says, give me one good reason why I shouldn't arrest you right now. And Glenn goes, I'll give you three. <laughs> and he says, because uh, I'm stuck here from California. I have no money. Um, I'll never, I, I'll, I'll, I won't be able to post bail. I won't be able to uh, get a lawyer. And I'll just sit in that cell and rot. And the guy goes, I don't know why I'm doing this. But get up, get us, get out of here. Let him go. Unheard of. <laughs> yeah, right. Said the right thing at the right time. Yeah, and you know he's getting his mohawk probably up. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, he, 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 the stories, the stories about that area. It sounds like he was getting in quite a lot of trouble. A lot of this. I mean, he couldn't go back to the states, could he? Basically, after no. The, he had a felony drug charge. Yeah, after this, after the Chamonix shoot, right? He had to stay, didn't he? Yeah. Well, he yeah he, he just even you know he really went to Chamonix. We did our did our thing and. I said, Glenn, you got to get back for that court date. And he goes, I'm not going. Fuck them. I'm not going. I'm like, Glenn, this is, this is like, this is your life here. You're making a, this is really a bad decision. He goes, I'm not, I'm not going. So I gave him all the cash I had, which is like, you know, 400 bucks maybe. And he stayed there. And then, you know, after Blizzard breaks, the Today Show wants him, which is, you know, he doesn't get much bigger than that. In, in from you know media in the states and we you know so then we have to get him into the states so i call his father and his father's like screw that kid i don't i don't care if he rots i'm not helping him because we needed five grand to hire a lawyer and the father wouldn't wouldn't help at all which was ironic because within a year the father had become his agent and then i had to deal with him and the guy's trying to get more money out of me and i was like jesus is this the same guy that wouldn't help because i spent five grand on a lawyer that 
got it so Glenn could arrive at JFK in New York, not get arrested, do the Today Show, and then go to California to face his charges. Um, and he did. He did time. Yeah. Because yeah. he had a possession charge, right? That was the thing. Oh, it was, yeah, it was more than possession. It was, he was on his way to trade a shoebox full of cocaine and mushrooms for a new BMW. Oh, well, there you go. I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> and he saw Sean Palmer on the side of the road with the flat tires. He pulled over to help Sean. And then, you know, of course, the cops see these two. They pull over and look in Glenn's car and, you know, what's in the shoebox? Yeah, there you go. Um, so, you know, earlier I was asking you about when you were talking about the the voiceover and how you were, you know, a bit embarrassed about it. And I, I kind of said, was it because you felt like you were overclaiming given the heritage that existed? You know, because because obviously Blizzard in particular, but also the movement that we're talking about is kind of credited with like the whole extreme, you know, thing going like in the newer sense of the world. I mean, not as an extreme skiing sense becoming like mainstream but obviously there was a culture of of extreme skiing and extreme mountain culture in existence in france um with you know a lot of, a lot of pioneers a lot of forebears did did you did you worry about like how that how it might go down the the film yeah, yeah well that, that, was a, that, that was one of the big things that i was embarrassed about the narration because here i am claiming these guys are the best you know and meanwhile you got you know patrick uh What's his freaking name? Is dead, and then uh, you know Bruno Gruve. And... Yeah, like the absolute, like absolute legends, especially that part of the world. Like you know the people that like pioneered all those routes, all those descents. Like I mean, because when you look at Blizzard, we, we're not skiing anything crazy compared to what those guys were doing. Yeah, like, real extreme skiers, you know. And so that's that was a really big thing. Was like, and and I remember when Blizzard first came out, there was a backlash in Channel Eight. Uh, well, like the Americans sort of doing the Valley Blanche and kind of claiming it's like super extreme kind of thing. Yeah, we're, you know, just who, who are we? Who am I to bring these people over there and claim they're, you know, they're the best, we're the best. And... But, so, but that's, well, that's so interesting, though, isn't it? Because essentially you packaged it in a particular way that, in, that meant, you know, it, it, I don't think it's exaggerating to say that like that, telling the story in that way has led to the landscape we've got today, you know, in terms of like the new meaning of extreme and and the culture that we have now, you know, like it's almost like those films were the first thing to to, to achieve that crossover success and convey this. You know, you, obviously you had like view, obviously you had like View to Kill, James Bond, as a huge thing as well. But you know, what I'm saying like it, it it definitely changed the narrative, the wider narrative. Oh, absolutely, and and. It launched extreme, you know, skiing in in the states. But even but even that's not true because there was these guys out at you know Squash Schmidt and and those guys they you know they were skiing this crazy steep stuff, you know, before I came along. And so I, my friend Jackson Hogan put it best. He said, you know, you didn't invent extreme, but you sure poured a lot of gasoline on the fire. <laughs> well, it's like it's it's culture and pop culture isn't it do you know what i mean like it's it's like it's a classic case of of a pop cultural moment changing like influencing the old culture like in our little world and that's the power of it that's why it's that's why it's so you know influential yeah and, then, and it's true once that movie came out man i couldn't you know I, I, fuck everybody wants to show me how extreme they are like, oh, <laughs> I'm not extreme. I'm just a camera guy. You know, I'm a bump skier. I'm not an extreme skier. That's funny. Yeah. And, oh, oh, you know, someone takes me for a snowmobile ride. They want to. They just, they just want to kill me. <laughs> Hold tight, Greg. <laughs> I did that once. I'm like, no, no, I'm not going to do that again. I'm not Mr. Extreme. I don't. You need to go 110 miles an hour in a Hummer through the desert. So, slow down. Let me out, actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's also what's so revealing about what you're saying about about Glenn as well. You know, the, the reservations that you had about his character, and because obviously at the end of the day, you would try to pull together a huge creative project, which is 
it takes a lot, lot of effort and concentration. <laughs> you know, the, there was no big company. There was no Warren Miller Productions or there was no company. There was me. There was Bruce Benedict was the other cameraman. And then I had a, a business marketing guy, Carl Labby. So it was just three of us. And as far as the production, I mean, Bruce and I shot in the movie. I did all the editing, all found all the music, did the narration, wrote the narration, recorded it. And, you know, it was. Yeah. Well, it's a lot. That's a lot of work. I mean, that's. that's... Yeah. Yeah, it was. But, you know, I'm I'm in my 20s. And, yeah. You know, it was gung ho. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So where did you find Murray? Murray Ball? Schmidt Oh, right. Okay. So it was like an, an old hookup. Yeah, Scott knew him from, uh, Scott had, uh, he had spent a lot of time in Verbier with Mark Shapiro, and uh, you know, so he knew Gary Bingham, and I, I knew Bingham a little bit, but Scott Scott knew uh, Mark Shapiro and Ace Cavalli, and did a lot of shooting with them, and so he, he was aware of Murray. And did you, you, you met him and thought, he's got to go in? because <laughs> obviously you give him quite a quite a role yeah well i mean he that, that was really scary to me like you know crevasses and fucking don't fall in a crevasse yeah okay, what? yeah and you know shaman he was just super eye-opening for me because i filmed in la clusa and uh les arcs before so i kind of knew a little bit about european skiing but i really didn't know you know chamonix that was just you know the north shore of the world <laughs> yeah well still is yeah i mean to this day you know mm -hmm. they still don't give a don't give a shit <laughs> it's like yeah go and do what you want and you know like you said the terrain is is pretty punchy a lot of it it's just not like other resorts is it I mean, in North no. America, obviously, you've got Alaska, clearly a, a different proposition. But in terms of like resort skiing, snowboarding, no, there's not that many resorts that compare. I mean, you know, maybe Revelstoke. Snowbird, I always thought, had some comparable European alpine. Yeah, but it's tiny compared to... Tiny, yeah. Small Everything, small nothing, compared, scale, yeah. Scale, scale can't compete for sure, yeah. So I remember when I went to the States for the first time, snowboarding that's what really surprised me just how kind of low and not flat because obviously there's steeps but yeah you know you just don't have that scale deer first place i well well this is this is hilarious now that i've said that well first place i rode in the states was vermont so <laughs> so definitely not chamonix mm -mm. but it was rad though i look you know it's great it's great to go in because I, I i was you know for us in the uk i was lucky enough to sort of as soon as we went to snow that's where we went french alps because you know for us it's like eight hour drive or something so um yeah it's the right passage that you do but yeah it was always I, another thing that you know telluride squall they were like ex really exotic to us you know when we watched those films of yours we were always like you know that's where we wanted to go because that was it seemed yeah really then you get there and it's like this really isn't that big <laughs> exactly yeah it's pretty yeah. flat <laughs> well when i lived at whistler uh, i would tell I, I tell people at whistler i go you know you could put you could put 10 jackson holes into whistler black home and you could put 10 whistler black homes into chamonix yeah fair. definitely you know? and they're like no way I go, yeah way this is not that big you want to see big go to sham Right, so Murray, you you felt because you so bringing it back to what we're talking about is, yeah, comfort zone scenario. Let's get the guide. Let's get the guy that's going to help us. Um, and it just oh, we didn't we didn't even know how to put harnesses on, or Schmidt did, but like the rest of us didn't. Right. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. Yeah, we we used to run a I used to run a snowboarding magazine, and one article we always used to talk about was trying to find Murray Ball. See what he was doing these days. What was the last time you spoke to him? Where I, you know, I think, I, I think I, I, I don't know if I talked to him on the phone, or I, I might have seen him in Chamonix, but he wasn't that he wasn't that nice to me because he he said you ruined my life. <laughs> <laughs> because again, yeah, because again, he was guiding illegally. 
he wasn't part of the French French guide. Of course. Thing. Of course. So he's in there, you know, he's he's guiding illegally, and then, then this huge this movie gets huge, and he's suddenly yeah. this high profile yeah, they- Chamonix guide that isn't even one of the French, you know. No, I don't forget what the unions. Yes, you know, yeah, the SF. Yeah, the SF. They don't. They're not going to like that. <laughs> no, they didn't like it. And so he told me, "But you ruined my life." Over here. That's funny. They go no high. Mm. So, what are you working on now, Greg? Well, I'm doing a radio show. I'll send you a link to it. Great. Um, I'm back into radio, and then my girlfriend and I are renovating a house slash commercial property and then i've got this building downtown that i'm turning into a, my new studio so i'm kind of more i mean the funny thing with the ski movies is i I've, I've made way more money um flipping houses <laughs> yeah i'm not surprised to hear that <laughs> I, well i started doing it right away you know as soon as i made any ski movie money i i, I bought something you know I had, I mean, I haven't rented since I was, I mean, I lived in Vail for a summer. That was the last time I rented anything. But, you know, I just, I, I bought shitty stuff and fixed them up, particularly in Hawaii. Did really well over there. Nice. Yeah. So cruising, taking, you know, working on, working yeah, on I mean, a few I'm things. I'm not rich, but I, I don't, uh, I don't sweat any nine to five things. Yeah, that's great. No, like I say, much like Scott's the, I mean, he's the director of skiing at the Yellowstone Club, and fuck, he makes six figures up there. That that sounds like a fairly exclusive gig. Oh yeah, <laughs> I don't... I, you can't even you, you can't even think about joining unless you got at least twenty million. Right, and you yeah. have to apply. And you can't just say you want to join. Right, but it's been great because the, the few times that we've been up there, you know. With Scott, it's you know, carte blanche. I mean, there's no, there's no money there. They don't use money, right? right. That's when you know you're rich. That's like the Queen, never carries cash. No, no. Like at the Yellowstone Club, you'd go to the restaurant, and, and uh, I felt bad the first day we had, we had lunch. And it was like a super exotic lunch up on the mountain. And there was no bill, and I, I see a waiter, and I try to give him a tip. He's like, I, I can't accept that, sir. There's no tipping here. Wow, that's how rich everyone here is. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and it's you know Bill Gates is there. Right. It's, wow. I'm actually we're I'm I'm pretty friendly with the uh, one of the main owners of the place, and you know again he's a Blizzard of Oz fan, but he's a developer out of Boston. Right. But, uh, but you know because all the, all those people that are you know my age are a little bit you know younger or older, right in that area, and. Uh, no, they're just billionaires, million, you know, huge, wildly wealthy. So yeah. it's been fun when we've gone up there as a guest. It's yeah, nice to experience nice. that every now and again. Yeah, because that's truly private powder. Yeah, like, for that, sure. That's what doesn't get tracked up. Like it's just there's not enough good skiers for one thing. Right. Yeah. So there are still a few spots if you've got enough money. Yeah, the Yellowstone Club, and then you know Big Sky's right next door, and that's a great. Probably, you know that's a you know it's a bustling yeah bustling yeah that's a, that's, i've got a friend from there actually she's always saying i should oh, yeah i've never never made it that far that's probably the best um the best ski area that i've seen there's a place up in montana a big mountain that i i have not seen it's supposed to be really good but probably the big sky Right, and you know that's another thing that, that happened as a result of Blizzard, is that uh, you know in Telluride, uh, they would have sheriffs at the bottom of Bear Creek and arrest you for skiing out of bounds pre Blizzard. Right, uh, Big Sky pre Blizzard, and uh, the owner of Big Sky told me he goes, "Yeah, oh, well, my my dad never would have built that tram at the top had it not been for Blizzard of Oz." Because um, everyone wanted to start throwing themselves off cliffs and yeah, they winging it down chutes. Big part of the mountain, the part of the mountain that didn't have a lift on it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, there you go. I mean, it's just another, yeah, another example of the influence, isn't it? The shift. Yeah. Of and then, you know, the, the word as a marketing word, I mean, golly, I mean, Jesus, you could get in for a while there. I mean, you could get an extreme combo at Taco Bell. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. No, it's. It, I mean, it's pervasive now, isn't it? It's everywhere. Yeah. Uh, so when I mean, I've God, we've been talking for an hour and a half nearly. That's gone really fast. Thanks so much for your time. I really enjoyed this. It's been great. As you can tell, I'm quite a geek about this stuff. So, thanks for uh, humouring all my questions. No, no, no. Thank you for thank you for uh, wanting to have me on your show. I mean, I guess my final question would be like looking, looking back now, like, do you have a standout memory from, from those years? Hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah, there was one day at the, um, at the bottom of that, I forget what it, the black forest is a, a chair at Chamonix, uh, down in the bottom of that. I forget what the that big, huge... at the bottom of the Grand Monte. Yeah. That bottom, I, that I, bottom chair. Uh, but it, not not to the base, but it was like if you look if you're looking at the mountain from the bottom, it's off to the right. That I had a powder day in there. In fact, I was supposed to go pick up Scott Schmidt at the airport, and I I blew it off going to Geneva because it was like this waist deep powder day. You know, I'm 27 years old and at the top of my game physically, and I just had the best. You know, because you never get to ski, like it was saying. I it was just that was. My standout memory from Chamonix is that powder day. Um, but, you know, of all the, I guess of all the things that, that it all led to, you know, meeting Seal was a big deal. But uh, because of all it, you know, the chain reaction eventually ended up, you know, with Willie Nelson. And I became friends with Willie Nelson and his family. And wow. I guess that's, that has to be my career highlight. Yeah, no doubt. I was listening to his new version of Under Pressure today. Have you heard that? It's really good. It's great. We carried on. So good. Yeah, and he's he's like, you know, he's like eighty six, eighty seven now. I mean, that is just incredible, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Have you heard his sons, Lucas? Now. Yeah, amazing yeah. as well. So we started working with Lucas early on. I mean, I you know that's I mean I knew Lucas when he was fourteen, uh, and you know just. I did it. I, I got to know Willie, you know, and you know, I used to go to his house and play on poker nights. And I, I even went to their place in, in Texas and stayed with them. And Great. It was just, a, you know, that, that has to be my career highlight is becoming, you know, friends with them, not just an acquaintance, but friends. Yeah. And then, and, really and then with, his, with his kids, especially Lucas, you know, we're, I, I joke with him whenever his birthday comes up. They go, "Well, you, I've now known you for over half your life." <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. That was me and Greg Stump, and I hope you enjoyed it. What an absolute privilege that one was. I'm sure you could tell I had an absolute whale of a time doing that, and I'm happy to report that Greg also seemed to enjoy himself enormously. Sometimes I am very, very lucky getting to do this show and this was one of those occasions. I really love that chat about his own insecurities around the voiceover and the way Blizzard of Oz landed with the original Chamonix Extreme crowd. I mean, it just goes to show you can have an absolutely enormous pop cultural crossover smash on your hands and still suffer from imposter syndrome. That part about repackaging the existing scene though and taking it to a new audience in a completely new way, that is completely real. And like I said at the beginning, you can't doubt the huge and lasting influence of that. And the other thing that was massively influential about Greg's take on the lifestyle, which was also something we discussed, is that it was skiers and snowboarders together. Now, back in my previous life, when I was doing a lot of work as a freelance travel writer and writing a lot about snowboarding for newspapers and magazines, which was a great gig, I've got to say, I got to go on a lot of ridiculous press trips, basically where they fly out a load of journalists to resorts or hotels or whatever and say, here you go, here's three days, have a good time and write us a nice article about it. Um, I got to do a lot of those trips, went to some great places. I made a lot of new friends. Um, among them, many very old school skiers who some of them have become dear friends of mine, they were forever trying to hype up this ridiculous rivalry between skiers and boarders, which is what they always used to say, which to my mind was just absolute bollocks. I mean, I skied, like I said earlier, before I snowboarded, 
My entire time riding, I've hung out with, lived with, and ridden with skiers. Any half serious mountain user knows that the whole thing is an absolute joke. And I personally think Greg had a huge amount to do with that crucial and early day taunt by the way he just accepted snowboarding and threw it in early. Anyway, if you haven't seen the Blizzard of ours, head on over to Greg's website, www.blizzardsnowstore.com and rectify that immediately. There are some clips up on YouTube, but really you need to see it all. And also just, you know, support somebody who's had such an influence by spending some money. I know we're not used to it these days, but I think I think in this case, it's probably worth it. All right. Been meaning to get all that stuff off my chest for years, as you can probably tell. Anyway, like I mentioned at the beginning, I used a piece of software called Zencaster for this one. I mean without getting too techy, remote recording podcasts is a hassle. You do rely on guests having a decent mic or a decent internet connection. You've probably been able to tell over the last few months, there's been some issues of fluctuating quality in some of the recordings that I've done. I've done some where people have recorded their side of the conversation on their phone, which has kind of worked. I've sent mics to people. And that actually is how this came about because one of the guests I get asked to interview fairly frequently is Rachel Atherton. And earlier this summer, I did end up interviewing Rachel and I sent her a mic, I sent her a USB mic so she could record her side of the conversation. And we had this really great conversation. It was an hour and a half long, really in depth, really quite emotional at points. Um, When Rachel sent me the file, unfortunately, she'd moved around during the interview and she dislodged the mic and it wasn't usable. She's actually been completely ghosted me since then, so I don't think we're going to be able to re-record it, but that's another story. Anyway, my mate Chris at Downtime Podcast asked me how the Rachel Atherton interview went, and when I told him that story, he said, oh, you want to try Zencaster? It's really great. Um, Chris went out of his way, arranged a dummy call with me so that we could run through it and make sure it worked. Got to say, the old podcasters union that is going these days is really great so thank you chris and if you've not checked out chris's downtime podcast which is a mountain bike podcast it's bloody great go and have a listen but yeah zencaster so i used it for this one i think it worked all right you know it's it has its advantages in that the guest doesn't need to do anything they just click a link and it records via the mic on their laptop which is what happened with with greg there greg obviously moved around quite a lot during that recording you know at one point i did say can you get nearer the mic so he does go in and out but i think it kind of worked um you know i just didn't want to spend too much time in that episode asking him to move closer to the mic because he was just such a great listen so i didn't so i hope you can sort of deal with that sound issue and i will keep experimenting to try and get the best sound possible all right as we pretty much had a housekeeping corner introduction this week, I'm going to leave it there. I'll be back next week. But in the meantime, thanks for listening. Nice one. <laughs>